I'm Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard. And we want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum for tonight's event. Uh, we've got a great crowd. We're excited to see all of you. Uh, first, I want to do a brief introduction of our moderator, then I'll do an introduction of our guest, and then we'll get started. David Gergen is the director of the Center for Public Leadership and is a professor here at the Kennedy School. And he actually got his start uh, in the speech writing office of President Nixon and then famously served as an advisor uh, to basically every president ever since. Uh, but he was in, in most uh, famously the, in the communication shop in President Reagan's administration. So a real expert on communications and speech writing and speech making. Uh, John Favreau, who's our guest today, was the director of speech writing for the President of the United States. Uh, started in the 2008 campaign, famously met him backstage at the 2004 Democratic Convention with a correction to his speech uh, when he was then working for uh, then presidential candidate and former U.S. Senator John Kerry. Uh, they hit it off and he got drafted for the OA campaign and the rest is history, which is why you're all here. So please join me in welcoming David and John to the forum. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. You're in for a real treat tonight. All of us are. I'm tempted before we start. Where did Trey go? Trey, whatever happened to Ashley Judd? Uh, in your home state of Kentucky, Kennedy School graduate decided today not to run. Uh, Nick just smoked her out before he even started. Right? <laughs> smoked her out? Yeah, smoked her out. She didn't want to run. I don't know. I didn't know that. Yeah, were you surprised? Yeah. I was, I was surprised too. She we need, could a, be we need a candidate. She could be in your first Hollywood deal. <laughs> She'd be a candidate. Uh, so it was interesting. Some years ago, uh, Bill Sapphire and Jack Valenti uh, organized a group called the Judson Welliver Society. And Judson Welliver was allegedly the first White House ghostwriter for a president, wrote for President Harding, if that's a distinction. Um, but in any event, the Judson Welliver Society brought together speech writers from across the years that go all the way back to the Truman administration and went up through, go up through today. Uh, and I, I happen to be a member of that group and Chris Matthews runs it now, Bill and Jack are both dead. But uh, the, we all decided that the one distinguishing characteristic of the group was that no one in the whole group had ever been indicted. <laughs> There's no other group in the White House of which that could be said as far as we could tell. Uh, but for a long, long time, the two iconic figures in that group uh, were Ted Sorensen and Peggy Noonan. And both came regularly. And I think in the opinion of many now, they will be joined by a third, and that's our guest tonight. John Favreau, we're delighted you're here. Uh, we're honored by your presence. Uh, we're we're going to talk among ourselves. Uh, we're going to talk just for a few minutes, and then John's going to show us some film clips of speeches in which he was heavily engaged as a principal speechwriter, uh, working for a president, of course, who's gifted in his own right, as few other presidents have been. You have to think back, maybe Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson could write in their own names very, very well, but not very many. Yeah. Uh, uh, Grant wrote a terrific memoir, but, but uh, was not distinguished for his presidency. The, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we'll, t we'll talk here for a while and then we'll open this up. So, John, how old were you when in to see Barack Obama in 2004 and told him what he had to do to fix his speech at the Democratic National Convention? Uh, I was 22 years old. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and? And uh, so I worked for the Kerry campaign and uh, my job during the convention in 2004 was to stay backstage at the convention here in Boston and make sure that all of the different speakers were on message, on the Kerry campaign's message. So um, I got a call from the road. Uh, John Kerry was writing his speech on the plane as he was traveling around the country. And uh, one of the speech writers that was on the road with him said, you know, we've seen Barack Obama's speech and Kerry wants to use a line that's in Obama's speech. Uh, he wanted to take the line. Well, this, all we know is that he said he wanted to use a line, right? There's, <laughs> there's yeah, warring stories here. But, uh, so I'm like, that's great. And then they're like, well, we want you to go tell him to take it out. <laughs> I was like, oh, thanks, great. Thought it was like a sick hazing ritual for the 22-year-old. Um, so I walked down the hall where Barack Obama was practicing his speech. And um, I, didn't, I knew Robert Gibbs, who was his communications director, because I had been his uh, press assistant back in the Kerry campaign. So I went up to Gibbs and I told him the whole thing and I said, you know, 
would you mind just telling Obama to take out the line? He's like, I'm not telling him. <laughs> He's like, you're going to tell him yourself. So I uh, walked into the room, and they paused the speech prep, and Obama kind of looks at me, and he's like, who the hell is this kid, you know? And uh, so I walked up to him, and I said, sir, you know, there's, there's a line, and I'm like mumbling all this horribly, you know, it's like barely getting out. And I tell him that he has to take the line out, and he just kind of stops, and he looks down at me, and he goes, are you serious? And uh, it's at that moment that I met David Axelrod, who was in the room, and um, He's the president's chief strategist, and he came over to me and he said, son, let's walk outside and let's rewrite the line together, and it'll all be okay. So Axwit and I went out, we rewrote the line, and that was it. Uh, and so I thought that was the last I ever heard from Barack Obama. But uh, John Kerry went on, obviously, to lose uh, the presidential race, and Barack Obama won the Senate race. And so I had no job, and um, I got a, an email from Gibbs who said, you know, it, it turns out that Barack Obama now needs a speechwriter. And uh, I said, why? And he said, well, you know, if there were 48 hours in a day, he wouldn't need a speechwriter. He'd be able to write all his own speeches, but there's not. He's a senator, he's got a national profile now, and he's going to need to learn to work with someone. So why don't you come in on his first week in the Senate, sit down with him, and see what he says. So I sat down with him, and uh, we had breakfast his first week in the Senate, and he looked at me and he said, so Gibbs tells me I need a speechwriter. I don't think I do. <laughs> um, but you seem nice enough, so let's give it a whirl. Let's try it out. And he, was, you know, he went on and asked about where I grew up, my family life, what got me into politics, what inspired me. So we had a really nice conversation. It was, you know, I actually wasn't that nervous compared to, you know, for what it was. Um, and then that was it. And then I started with him in the uh, in the Senate office in 2005. Were you his principal speechwriter then in the Senate? I was, yeah, there was only one of us. It was just me. Uh huh. That. And tell us how the relationship developed from there. How did, they, how did you work it out as you went? So those first two years in the Senate, um, you know, he was busy, but obviously not as busy as he would later become. And so before every speech, I would sit in his office with him, and he would talk for 20 to 30 minutes about what he wanted to say in any given speech. And I would just type. I would type as fast as I can. I would well, with, it with, with him standing there talking to you? Yeah, with him standing there talking. There's no note-taking. I'm a horrible note-taker. My penmanship's like a second grader. Um, so I had to have my laptop in there, and I just, you know, started pounding out words as fast as I could. And, uh, and I, you know, I also had two books to work from, because he had written, um, you know, Dreams from My Father, and he was working on Audacity of Hope while we were in the Senate. So during those two years, through our conversations and through those speeches, I got to learn his voice. Um, you learned, did you, <clears throat> after the speeches were over, did you sit down and talk about them, what worked, what didn't work? Yeah. Yeah, he would come back from, you know, if he would travel somewhere to give a speech, he would come back and say, you know, I like this part. On something like this, maybe we need a story here. We need to look for more, you know, anecdotes, a better statistic here. So we would go back and forth like that. Did you begin to have a file of things that you kept for speeches, stories? and? Yes. It start, <laughs> I would start researching stories. I would start researching statistics, anecdotes. And a lot of it, you know, was pulled from uh, dreams from my father, from his own life, because he had mm -hmm. such a rich biographical experience. Right. That, you know, I, I read that book so many times, and the way the stories are in the book makes sense for a nice story, but there's so many issues that a, that a senator speaks about that yeah. fit perfectly to, to really yeah. tell the story of who he is. There's, there's a strong parallel here uh, between what Ted Sorensen's relationship with Jack Kennedy. He worked for him in his Senate office building, traveled with him. Was it, he was an advisor, but he was also his chief writer, and they from 1956, when Kennedy almost got the nomination for vice president, they traveled incessantly, and they went back and forth and back and forth, yeah. and they developed, Kennedy developed his voice. Right. And, and it doesn't happen and all at once, and it's very gradual. You know, you don't know gradual. what's happening, yeah. but you just start thinking and writing like he does. You, know? you, I mean, you mean the, your capacity to write in his voice yes. develops gradually. Yeah. But does his voice also, did you find his voice changing over time? You know, if so, it was so, like, barely perceptible because I was there every day. I, I didn't really... I think he learned... I mean, before he gave that 2004 convention speech, he hadn't given... And he, it was that speech and the speech where he spoke out against the Iraq War, right? Those were his two major big platform speeches in his career. His other speeches were, you know, he was a... He had been a lecturer at the University of Chicago, and so they were a little more professorial and... So he did learn over time 
kind of the campaign cadence, right, and, um, and how to do that. But he never let go of the authenticity and um, the logic of how he wanted to structure a speech. He's very, I mean, the lawyer in him very much comes out when he's writing a speech because not just will he give me, you know, like a nice line or, you know, some great rhetoric, uh, he will say, I want the speech structured, here's one, here's one A, here's two, here's two B, here's how the argument's gonna go. And he knows that off the top of his head right before we start. Right. Peggy Noonan has made the argument in one of her books on, on, on speaking well, that this obsession with the one-liner uh, is, is a way overdone. That's not what really makes a speech work. No, it's not. What, I mean, does, I, what does make a speech work from your view? What makes a speech work is telling a, a story from beginning to end. It's a narrative that holds throughout the entire speech. And you know, the, the first time I met with him, uh, and I had that interview with him for the job, that's, he said, you know, what did you like about the 2004 convention speech? I said, the 2004 convention speech was a story about America, and you fit your story in the larger story of what's happened in this country. And it had a beginning, a middle, and the end. And therefore, it captivated people through the entire speech. If you are writing a speech for a line, right, or you're writing a speech for a couple sound bites, you will, you will end up forcing the line or the sound bites into the speech um, to the detriment of the rest of the story that you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. right? Because so, you know, if you get caught with too many consultants and posers and all those kind of people, they will tell you like, well, it's much more important than we have this soundbite way up high in the speech because then the reporters will write about it that way. You know? And for us speechwriters, that's like, well, you can't just randomly put something there. You know, it's, it, there's a whole structure here. That's not how you talk. Right. right. So, but, but how does the narrative idea fit with the 1A, 1B, 1C? Uh, logic because structure. Sometimes that's the, the story is the, the logical structure of what he's trying to, I mean, you know, when we did the race speech, that's exactly how he um, laid out the race speech. Good. Why don't we, why don't you talk us through now some of these uh, clips? We'll just, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just turn off here, let you, let you run the show, we'll show some clips, and you can tell us what we're looking at, give us some context of the speech, maybe an anecdote or two as we go. Great. Uh, I think so, so this first clip that we're showing is from the uh, Jefferson Jackson dinner, uh, which the president delivered in uh, November of 2007. Made a huge difference in the campaign. Huge difference in the campaign. At this point in the campaign, we were down about 20 to 25 points to Hillary Clinton in the polls. You know. Most of the pundits had declared that we were dead, that Hillary was going to win, that it was all over. We still have the headline from the New York Post that said, like, Hill's coronation happening soon, you know? And, uh, and this was an opportunity. In Iowa, the race was much closer, though we were still struggling. We were basically in a three-way tie with John Edwards and Hillary Clinton. And the Iowa Jefferson Jackson dinner offers every candidate in the Democratic primary an opportunity to speak at one forum, all in a row, together, so that everyone, every supporter on all sides can uh, get a taste of what they have to say. And um, you know, this, for us, was our big chance, because we were so far down in the polls. We didn't have much time to turn around in Iowa. And if he was going to make an impression and there was going to be some kind of a game-changing event, this speech had to be it. So. Let's cue it up. <clears throat> I always knew this journey was improbable. I've never been on a journey that wasn't. I am running in this race because of what Dr. King called the fierce urgency of now. Because I believe that there's such a thing as being too late. And that hour is almost upon us. I don't want to wake up four years from now and find out that millions of Americans still lack health care because we couldn't take on the insurance industry. I don't want to see that the oceans have risen a few more inches. The planet has reached a point of no return because we couldn't find a way to stop buying oil from dictators. I don't want to see more American lives put at risk because no one had the judgment or the courage to stand up against a misguided war before we sent our troops in to fight. I, I don't want to see homeless veterans on the streets. I don't want to send another generations of American children to failing schools. I don't want that future for my daughters. I don't want that future for your sons. 
I do not want that future for America. Turned it around? Turned around the campaign? Yeah, it did turn around the campaign. It was a, it was a funny night because, um, you know, we had the way that the order was in the Jefferson Jackson dinner was completely determined randomly. And uh, so all the other candidates were first. And then it was Hillary. And then it was Obama at the end. And so we actually were happy with that order because <laughs> we figured <laughs> he would go last and, um, and, you know, we'd have the best comparison, best direct comparison. But, you know, what we saw there was we had a decision to make, right, which was Hillary was running on experience. She was running on, you know, I have the command of the policy, I have the command of the facts. And we had gone through, you know, trying to prove our experience, trying to prove all the policy papers that we had. We were, you know, gave how, however many policy speeches. But the question was, you know, for two candidates who actually did agree on most of the policy that they were arguing about in the race, how to differentiate him at this critical moment. And the passion that we got into there was what we decided. He, we, I mean, he talked about the fierce urgency of now. But we all decided that he needed urgency, that if he wanted this thing, if he wanted this race, he needed to go out there and look like he wanted it more than anything else. So he not only used the language, he showed the urgency. He showed the urgency. Through the passion. And this is, uh, this is one of the only speeches uh, that the president has ever memorized. Uh, he, he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a transcript. There's no prompter there. He has no prompter? No. And so he, uh, you know, he'll give some speeches off the cuff from, from the heart. And he'll use the prompter a lot and he'll read some speeches. But the way the JJ is structured, it's in the round. The only option is to memorize, and it's 10 minutes, which was the other benefit to this speech, because he had been going around Iowa for the last couple of months, and the stump speech was growing longer and longer and longer, and it's like 40 minutes, and we're talking about ethanol, and you know, suddenly, <laughs> like, let's get it back together here. So this was the perfect exercise to distill the message down to what it was going to be. And it's funny, because he, he put so much time into it that... Uh, the week before he delivered the speech, we were at a random hotel by the Des Moines uh, airport. And when you walked by the president's room, you could hear him practicing the speech to himself as he was walking around because he wanted to make sure that he memorized every word and he nailed it. Well, I have a dream. The, the portion of that speech that works is without, you know, without notes. That's come straight, to, uh, straight out of Dr. King. Right. It comes out of that passion. Right. Where if you can get to your passion point. Let's, let's go on to the next speech. Uh, so the next speech is the speech that the uh, president delivered on the night of the New Hampshire primary, uh, a primary which we thought we were going to win because all the polls told us we were going to win uh, by upwards of 10 points, and uh, then we did not. And so it was quite a shock to all of us, and um, we had to quickly figure out what to do about the speech, because we'd already had a speech written. Uh, but as we got closer to uh, him actually delivering the speech, we realized that the speech we had written was probably the perfect speech for the occasion. Really? Yeah, and so I'll tee up the clip, and then I'll talk about why. We know the battle ahead will be long. But always remember that no matter what obstacles stand in our way, nothing can stand in the way of the power of millions of voices calling for change. We have been told we cannot do this by a chorus of cynics, and they will only grow louder and more dissonant in the weeks and months to come. We've been asked to pause for a reality check. We've been warned against offering the people of this nation false hope. But in the unlikely story that is America, there has never been anything false about hope. For when we have faced down impossible odds, when we've been told we're not ready, or that we shouldn't try, or that we can't, Generations of Americans have responded with a simple creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. 
Yes, we can. So, uh, Ben Rhodes and I, who's my, one of my fellow speechwriters, had written that speech uh, the night before on the drive from Nashua to Manchester at like midnight. We're driving back from some campaign event. And Ben's driving and I got the laptop and you know we're thinking it's going to be a victory speech so we have all this kind of celebratory language. And the president calls and he said, you know, I know you guys are working on the speech for tomorrow. And I know everyone thinks that we're going to win. Hopefully we do. But I do not want this to be an easy speech. I do not want this to be a speech that's just rah-rah celebration. Because even if we do win tomorrow, it's going to be hard. The rest of the primary is going to be hard. The general election is going to be hard. And everything that we're trying to do and change is going to be hard. And so I want some grit in this speech so that when I give it, it's not just telling everyone to like cheer and celebrate and go on to the next thing. So those lines that he just delivered were written because the president told us to do that. Hmm. And once we realized that Hillary had won the race, uh, we you know, read the rest of the speech and said, this is a perfect speech for people who have temporarily faced a setback, but in the end need to keep pushing forward. And so we changed the top line of the speech to congratulations to Senator Clinton for her victory tonight, and then we didn't do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and he went out there, and you know that ended up rallying uh, a lot of our supporters. So that helped out. Was the cheering on Yes We Can spontaneous? Yeah. Because what had happened is uh, Yes We Can started in the 2004 yeah. Senate campaign that they had used it there. We hadn't brought it back throughout the 2007, 2008 campaign uh, until that moment. Hmm. Because... Uh, he, you know what, the night before in Iowa, he had randomly thrown out a yes we can, just kind of like off the cuff, and someone started cheering for it, and we kind of all looked at each other and were like, maybe we should bring back the old 2004 yes we can. And so as we started this speech, we found the whole riff um, there. But I think the cheering was more spontaneous because it, it would have been less uh, loud and boisterous had we won, I think, at yeah. yes we can. Yeah. But at that point it was... But you lost, but yes, we And did you feel this, this speech revived the campaign coming out of Iowa? Gave you, you know, it's, it's unclear whether it revived the numbers or anything like that, but that was a speech for the supporters, for everyone who had been so disappointed by what happened. You know, huge win in Iowa, thought we were going to do it in New Hampshire, and then that was going to be it. And so for everyone who was very disappointed and thinking to themselves, you know, maybe this isn't it, maybe we can't do this, I think for our people, that helped them a lot. Mm -hmm. so. Let's go on to the next. Um, so the next speech uh, is the Philadelphia race speech. So this was obviously the speech uh, that the president gave uh, after uh, responding to the comments made unearthed by uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, which is a real fun part of the campaign. Um, so what happened there is those comments surfaced on a Friday, I believe, on ABC that night. The president did a round of interviews on cable to try to quash the whole thing. Um, it did not work. <laughs> and the cable interviews, we started all realizing, are just not a good venue to actually talk about this. So Saturday morning, I think Friday night, he called a bunch of his advisors and said, I, I need to give the speech on race that I've been wanting to give for a while. And I need to make it about this. And so then the next morning, all the advisors called me and they said, oh, he wants to give a race speech. But he's campaigning all day, so why don't you just start writing it? And I'm like, I'm not writing that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not writing that speech unless I talk to him, because this is so personal, you know? So I sat around all day Saturday. And then Saturday night at 10.30 at night, he calls me from the road. And uh, he's like, OK, well, I have some ideas, just off the top of my head. And for like 45 minutes, he just dictated, like I was saying, here's the argument I want to make first, and then I want to say this, and then this is 2B, and this is 3. I mean, he had the whole outline in his head. And so I hung up with him that night, and uh, then I woke up early the next morning, and I spent all day Sunday doing a draft. Sent it to him Sunday night, and then he spent until 3 o'clock in the morning doing rewriting. Gave it to me the next day. I worked on it a little bit on Monday. 
he spent till three o'clock in the morning again, Monday night. And when you look at the edits of that speech, the stuff that I wrote in that um, is language that you know pretty much anyone could have written. You know, I did not write the line, I can no more disown him than I can disown my white grandmother. <laughs> that is not a line I would have given to the president myself. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, so he, he did all that personal stuff, and he finally sent it around at about four in the morning on Tuesday. And he said, this is what I want to say. I don't want anyone to touch it. Favreau can touch it for you know, touch-ups on rhetoric and grammar and stuff like that, but this is it. I don't know if this will work, but this is what I want to say, and this is what I have to do to be president. And he gave a speech on Tuesday. And he gave a speech on Tuesday. 11 o'clock or something like that. Yeah. It was a powerful speech. Probably the most powerful speech he gave as a candidate. I mean, so what? I've, I've often wondered if Bill Sapphire were still alive, you know, with his anthology, Lend Me Your Ears, whether this wouldn't be the first entry, maybe the 2004 speech and then this. Yeah. It was very, I mean, we have a clip for it. Let's, no. let's see. For we have a choice in this country. We can accept a politics that breeds division and conflict and cynicism. We can tackle race only as spectacle, as we did in the OJ trial, or in the wake of tragedy, as we did in the aftermath of Katrina, or as fodder for the nightly news. We can play Reverend Wright's sermons on every channel every day and talk about them from now until the election and make the only question in this campaign whether or not the American people think that I somehow believe or sympathize with his most offensive words. We can pounce on some gaffe by a Hillary supporter as evidence that she's playing the race card, or we can speculate on whether white men will all flock to John McCain in the general election regardless of his policies. We can do that, but if we do, I can tell you that in the next election, we'll be talking about some other distraction, and then another one, and then another one, and nothing will change. And now, the reason I, I like that clip is what he did there and what he does well in his best speeches is he cut through all the crap, and he just spoke to what was on people's mind, and he spoke the truth. And that's... I mean, that, that passage right there was less about race in itself than it was about his larger commentary on the state of politics in the media and what happens in these campaigns. And, you know, and he set out to run thinking that, yes, there are a lot of distractions. Yes, there's tons of silliness in politics. There's all kinds of controversies and dust-ups that you have to deal with. But, you know, we have a choice as a country. We can follow those rabbits, right? And we can, you know, entertain ourselves that way. But if we do that, we're never going to fix any of the problems that we've talked about. I mean, at its core, that's why he ran, and that's what he believed in. And I think to the extent that that speech was effective, um, it was about him kind of cutting through and, 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 you know, speaking to that kernel of truth. What you're also suggesting is that it's critically important, especially on special moments, to have a core. Yes. To know what you believe. Exactly to have a settled sense of what your philosophy is, what you're willing to fight for. Right. And that's why we, ne you know, unlike various other elected leaders, you know, you never have, you know, 10 different advisors around and people not, you know, everyone warring factions about who should, how the candidate should say what and everyone fighting. Because everyone knew that at the end of the day, Barack Obama knows what he believes in and he knows what he wants to say. And, you know, does he need help getting it on paper? Does he need help getting his message out, whether it's through ads or communications or anything else? Yeah, of course. Um, but fundamentally, he, he has a core about him, about why he ran and what he wants to do. And I think, you know, that's enormously helpful. Hmm. Now, he has a different side, too. He can be very funny. He can. He can be very funny. And he enjoys being very funny. So the next clip is um, one of the more difficult speeches we work on is actually the White House Correspondence Center speech. Uh, because the president's supposed to tell jokes for about 20 minutes. Usually there's a professional comedian that precedes him. Um, and there's all these celebrities in the crowd, and it's like 
all this, this ridiculous thing that happens every year in Washington. Um, but it's a lot of fun, and I've worked on them over the last couple of years, and we have had the good fortune of you know, various joke writers, professional and amateur, contributing uh, a lot of lines. And so basically, we sit down, and John Lovett, who had uh, written, was one of the speechwriters that worked with me, he has since gone on to do a television show of his own, 1600 Pen. And um, so Lovett and I would work on these speeches together, and we would just collect all the jokes we could find from everyone. <laughs> and, you know, you have two categories of jokes. One, jokes that were really funny, that there's no way the president could tell without getting in trouble. <laughs> and we have a pile of those somewhere that we still laugh at. And then so there's that'd a... That'd be a great book. It would be a great book, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Highly inappropriate. Um, <laughs> and then there's a pile of jokes that are just so cheesy that politicians usually say them and we don't want them, right? So there's a sweet spot. And, uh, and so finding that each year was very, very difficult. But uh, this year, in 2011, we had a lot of material to work with because uh, Donald Trump uh, had decided that he was going to make an issue of the president's birth certificate um, again. So, uh, and then we had the good fortune of having Donald Trump at the dinner. So uh, we decided to have a little fun with that, and that's the clip that we're going to see. What a week. <laughs> As some of you heard, uh, the state of Hawaii released my official long-form birth certificate. Hopefully, that this puts all doubts to rest. But just in case there are any lingering questions, tonight, I'm prepared to go a step further. Tonight, for the first time, I am releasing my official birth video. <laughs> now, I warn you, no one has seen this footage in 50 years. Not even me. But uh, let's take a look. to square one. <laughs> I, I want to make clear to the Fox News people, that was a joke. <laughs> uh, that was not my real birth video. That was a children's cartoon. <laughs> Call Disney if you don't believe me. They have the original long form version. Michelle Bachman is here, though, I understand, uh, and she is thinking about running for president. It's weird because I hear she was born in Canada. <laughs> yes, Michelle, this is how it starts. Uh, <laughs> so that was a fun night. Who, where'd that come from? Where'd the, the, idea? the Lion King thing? Yeah, the Lion King. I actually, I don't know how, we were trying to brainstorm like what the best way to do that was, and I just thought of the, let's, let's go with the Lion King circle of life thing. <laughs> so we, uh, and then our new media team at the White House who help us every year and are brilliant, like they sat there and clipped it all and put it together and had the little like recording dot in the corner so it looked like it was the actual video. And so we worked on that for, for many, many weeks. Um, but where he's really good is, you know, after the video played, and he did the Fox News table joke. Everything after that was kind of his ad lib, you know, and he just really milked it, right? And he kind of draws it out. So he has a really good sense of timing. 
on these two. Yeah, that wasn't in the script, the Fox News? Fox News one was, and then after that, the Walt, call Walt Disney, yeah, yeah, back right. to square one. Right. Like, all that kind of stuff he just did on the He just goes with it. Yeah. And he, like, you know, we, we practice these, um, uh, these jokes at least, like, once or twice in the Oval with him, and he delivers them to us, and we laugh, and we go back and forth, and we you know, cross out the ones that don't work. But that story I always tell about that was, um, so that day, we uh, walked into the Oval to go over the jokes with him one more time. And he's like, I love it. Everything's great. Good. He goes, there's one joke um, with the punchline that I think you should change. I was like, oh, what's that? He goes, you have Osama bin Laden as a punchline. He's like, I just think it's kind of been done to death now, and like, we don't need to do more bin Laden. And like, I would, just, I would appreciate it if you just used another dictator. And I was like, what about Hosni Mubarak? He's like, perfect. Love Hosni Mubarak. Let's do it. Done. <laughs> and sure enough, the next day was the bin Laden raid after this. But did he, he took it out knowing. Yeah. He told you to take it out without telling you. Without telling us. But he took it out, he told us to take it out without casting any suspicion over why. He was just like, ah, it's kind of a tired joke. And you had no, you had we, no hint he had that just, it was coming. We were waiting for our meeting, and they told us our meeting was delayed because he was making a phone call to a general in Afghanistan. He was making the call to, like, give it a go. And, and we're out there, like, impatient with our little videos laughing, you know, we're like, come on, <laughs> laugh how, at us. The, you know? the juxtaposition for him from being on a phone call to Afghanistan saying it's a go to having the next meeting being about jokes that night at a dinner. And then, you know, and right... And pull that off. No, and then right before the dinner, he called me with one last edit. And he's like, would you please add... He's like, I'll, I'll know it on my own, but I just want you to add it in case um, to have everyone pray for our troops tonight. Really? Yeah. And I was like, it's an odd thing. You know, I mean, it's not odd for him to do that, but it was an odd kind of last minute addition. He's like, I'm going to do it. I just don't want to forget. So he had been thinking about it. So it was weighing on his mind. And, you know. But yeah, the, the compartmentaliz compartmentalization you have to do as president is just mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. The speeches that are, the, the, in some ways, the most poetic as president are the inaugurals. Mm -hmm. And you've worked on two now. Mm -hmm. And so the first one uh, was a very difficult speech to write because it had been, we started writing it as the president had been learning about, you know, the terrible state the economy was in. And what he learned from all his briefings was not just what we were all feeling about the economy currently, but how much worse it was going to get. And so, you know, like from Larry Summers to Christina Romer to Tim Geithner to Peter Orzag, they all gave him all these different briefings in Chicago, one worse than the next, about how awful everything was. And so, as we were writing the first inaugural, the challenge becomes, how do you prepare people for how bad things are going to get? and let them know the scope and size of the challenges while still giving people a sense of confidence that we're going to get through it. And so that balance becomes a, a difficult one to strike. Mm -hmm. and I'll show you the clip. And that we are in the midst of crisis is not well understood. Our nation is at war against a far-reaching network of violence and hatred. Our economy is badly weakened, a consequence of Greed and irresponsibility on the part of some, but also our collective failure to make hard choices and prepare the nation for a new age. Homes have been lost, jobs shed, businesses shuttered. Our health care is too costly, our schools fail too many, and each day brings further evidence that the ways we use energy strengthen our adversaries and threaten our planet. These are the indicators of crisis subject to data and statistics. Less measurable, but no less profound, is a sapping of confidence across our land. A nagging fear that America's decline is inevitable, that the next generation must lower its sights. Today, I say to you that the challenges we face are real. They are serious, and they are many. They will not be met easily or in a short span of time. But know this, America, they will be met. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so 
you can see, you know, we tried to end it kind of on an up note. Uh, you know, they will be met. But then instantly, you have to go back into all the horrible things that are happening, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a, uh, it was a tough one. It was a tough speech. And on the composition of a speech like this, what was the, your relationship to him and how, how this per was prepared? He, uh, you know, I did a few drafts uh, along with the speechwriters. We all kind of worked together on a draft. And then he took it and he, he did a bulk of the writing himself. He really wanted to, I think he knew that it's an inaugural and, you know, you're writing for history in some ways. And so he was very kind of concerned with the language, right, to make sure that you have we have new phrases and phrases that are going to be memorable and all that kind of stuff. So he took a lot of care working on that one himself. Um, and, uh, but I think we ended up, you know, and the speech goes on to talk about, you know, it gets into, it does actually a lot of foreign policy. Uh, and then at the end, we kind of tell the story about Washington crossing the Delaware and Valley Forge and how things were tough then as kind of an example of how we faced down tough times before but overcome. How do you trace the arc of his view of the presidency uh, of leadership between his first inaugural and his second inaugural? How has he changed? How has he sort of, what has he learned that is now instructing him as he leads? You know, I think by his second inaugural, uh, as we met to talk about that, he said, look, this is going to be a speech that discusses what I believe. This is gonna sum up what I've stood for for my whole life, what my presidency is gonna be about, has been about, and what my presidency is gonna be about. And if I, you know, I wanna speak about things that if I can get them done in the second term, great, and I wanna to try to get them done in the second term. But if I can't, I want people to know that this is what I believe is their leader. And, you know, and that they might complete the journey? And that they might complete the journey. You know, he says that often on climate change. You know, I hope mm -hmm. to get something done on climate change, yeah. but I will be talking about it, and at the very least, maybe I can shift the conversation so it's ready for the next president. That's what Franklin Roosevelt did, 1944. Yeah. Speech that became sort of the yeah. rally. We actually looked at uh, Roosevelt's second and third a lot mm -hmm. when we were doing the second inaugural. Mm -hmm. Because the interesting thing is a lot of second inaugurals, I was surprised, are not that great. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you, you kind of get the disease where it's like you're trying to talk about every single accomplishment you've had over the last four years and you need to hit every, you know, you, you think about it as a state of the union, right? Mm -hmm. And so the ones that we looked to that actually did a good job, we thought that Bush's second inaugural um, rhetorically was a really great speech because it had a theme and it had a story. And it had his core. And it had his core. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. speeches like that, you know, I mean, however history judges it, right? His, we're all kind of victims to how history judges it, but, you know, as a statement of principle, it's good. But so the first inaugural was more about where we are as a country and what we have to do to make sure we understand tough times are coming, but we're going to right. rally. But the second one is more of a personal statement. Yeah, it's a personal statement, but it's also, I think he thought of it as a personal statement, but also a statement of what he ran on and won this election on, right? I see. So a lot of the, it was funny to me when a lot of the, the commentary was, oh, he's taken a liberal turn or he's taken this turn. I mean, most of what we talked about in the second inaugural, he had just been campaigning on every single day for the last three or four months. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was even surprised with, you know, I, I didn't realize until the day before or two days before that it would be the first time a president has mentioned the word gay in an in inaugural. Mm -hmm. And Cody and I were sitting around and we're like, oh, I guess that's probably gonna make news. But the reason we didn't think that is because he had been talking about that on the campaign trail for the last three or four months. Mm. Why don't we take a look at that last yeah. clip? We, the people, declare today that the most evident of truths, that all of us are created equal, is the star that guides us still, just as it guided our forebears through Seneca Falls and Selma and Stonewall, just as it guided all those men and women, sung and unsung, who left footprints along this great mall, to hear a preacher say that we cannot walk alone, to hear a king proclaim that our individual freedom is inextricably bound to the freedom of every soul on earth.
It is now our generation's task to carry on what those pioneers began. For our journey is not complete until our wives, our mothers, and daughters can earn a living equal to their efforts. Our journey is not complete until our gay brothers and sisters are treated like anyone else under the law. For if we are truly created equal, then surely the love we commit to one another must be equal as well. Our journey is not complete until no citizen is forced to wait for hours to exercise the right to vote. Our journey is not complete until we find a better way to welcome the striving, hopeful immigrants who still see America as a land of opportunity, until bright young students and engineers are enlisted in our workforce rather than expelled from our country. Our journey is not complete until all our children from the streets of Detroit to the hills of Appalachia to the quiet lanes of Newtown know that they are cared for and cherished and always safe from harm. Hmm. Hmm. So it's interesting watching this as the last one and the uh, Jefferson Jackson dinner is the first one. In that part of the speech, as we got towards the end, we wanted to make sure there was that same sense of urgency. That was part of what the speech was about, is returning to that sense of urgency. Um, and we wanted it to be determined. That was the tone that we set. Because, you know, there's all this, he's got a second term, is he gonna kinda just ease into it? Is he gonna not care? Is he gonna worry about fighting with Congress? Is he gonna stand up there and magically bring everyone together? And, you know, what he kind of thought it was, look, what I'm going to do is say what I believe and what I think that the American people believe and voted for. And I'm going to show that I really want it, that I believe in these things, and I'm going to fight for them over the next four years. And I'm not just going to sit here passing time for four years, that I'm really going to, you know, I'm going to do this. And so I think that's where that, a lot of that, uh, at least that's how we tried to end the speech. So. That was a wonderful tour. I have many more questions, but I think it's really important we go to the floor and let sure. others participate. So there are microphones here and here, and there are microphones here and here. Uh, and uh, we'll go with the standard rules of uh, one uh, question per customer, and each question ends with a question mark. Why don't we start here, please, ma'am? Okay. Um, if you would identify yourself, please. Thank you for you both for being here. My name is Monica Garcia. I'm an MPH student at the Harvard School of Public Health. And um, I have the question, what are some speech writing strategies that you have utilized to effectively reach specific constituents? I'm thinking um, of ethnic minority groups, especially with the rising acknowledgement of the importance of like, a the Asian American vote and the Latino vote. It's interesting. Um, I don't know if there's specific strategies. Um, one, one thing that we like to do a lot in speeches is to draw on anecdotes um, because it's a lot more interesting to hear a story about someone's life <laughs> and what they're going through and what they've achieved than it is to hear just like pablum about policy and stuff like that. So when we go through uh, our anecdotes, we always want to make sure we're finding anecdotes that are diverse as possible and so that um, we're getting the entire mosaic of American life in the president's speeches. And, um, and so that usually helps us uh, uh, reach out to as many people as possible. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is uh, Justin. I currently work for the city of Boston, but I actually had the honor of being an intern in the administration in the summer of 2011. Okay. Um, question about some of the more wonky speeches, like mm -hmm. the State of the Unions, or I'm thinking about the 2009 health care reform speech, how you find that balance between telling that larger story, but also explaining policy where you're talking about health exchanges in the middle of the speech, but then the letter from Ted Kennedy at the end of the speech and how you sort of find that balance between telling the story and communicating a message, but also getting the policy details across. Yeah, it's the most difficult balance actually because, uh, and it's a space issue, right? I mean, because 
I always, I'm the, like, the space Nazi in speeches on the timing one, right? I want to make sure that we do not have him droning on for like 50, 60, 70 minutes about, on a speech. And so for that speech in particular, um, the goal was people need to know what this healthcare plan is going to do. But if he goes up there and he gives like a PowerPoint presentation about it, <laughs> he will lose everyone, right? You will lose the audience. Maybe some people will applaud him for going into the details finally, right? But not the American people. Uh, so it, it, in that sense, it helps kind of condensing what the plan was to as simple formulation as possible. And then usually, um, you save the good story for the end of the speech, right? Because then you know people will pay attention long enough, and then they'll hear that. But we were very lucky in that speech to have that letter from from Ted Kennedy because um, we didn't have an ending uh, and we didn't know what the ending was going to be and you know we had told so many stories about different people and their healthcare struggles and you know, it turns out two days before the speech David Axrod says you know we just got a letter from Vicki Kennedy and she said that her husband wrote it a couple months ago and that the president is to open it upon his death and you know I think we should. I'm like, well, we could probably use that for the speech. We should get that letter. <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, you know, she rushed it over, and it was you know, vintage Ted Kennedy. And he had that one line in the letter that said, you know, this is, uh, which speaks to your question, health care is, is about more than a policy debate. This is about the character of our country. This is about who we are and what we stand for. And we took that line, and that became the basis for the ending. So, But it's a very tough balance, and you've just got to be, you know, you got to be careful with the words and, you know, try to edit out as much as possible so that you're just, your only goals are clearly explained, simple policy in as little words as possible, and then spend as much time as you can on kind of uplifting, inspiring language that's going to stick with people. Please. <clears throat> um, good evening, Mr. Favreau. Uh, my name is Alex Solis, and I'm a freshman at the college. I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee, mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask the official Twitter question. Um, so Twitter user Andrew Weiner would like to ask, what was the funniest or most unique experience you had with Obama on the 2008 campaign? The funniest or most unique experience in the 2008 campaign? The, which one? The funniest or the most unique? Uh, either or, sir. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think about that one. Probably the funniest experience I had, even though for me it was the most harrowing. Um, I am uh, not a great flyer, and so, and I had never flown on a really small plane. And at the beginning we, uh, of the campaign, we didn't have a lot of money. We had to take these flights from Des Moines to Chicago that were basically like four seaters. And it was just like the president, Gibbs, Reggie, who could like barely fit into the plane, and me. And we're pulling up to the plane, and uh, no one knows that I'm scared of flying, but my buddy, um, Tommy Vitor, who was the Iowa press secretary, knew. And so he tells the president, he goes, by the way, Senator, John's really, really, really afraid of flying, so you should just know that before you get on this plane. And the president just smiles, and we get on the plane, and he just starts telling stories of like all the horrible flights they've had. <laughs> <laughs> and then... <laughs> plane, start, plane starts taking off, and he's like across from me, right? And we're like pretty close, because the seats are close. And I'm sitting like this, and I think that I'm hiding it pretty well, and so I'm just like doing this. <laughs> and like as the, we're, in the, we're just, you know, ascending, the president looks down from the newspaper and he goes, are you going to keep doing that the entire flight? <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, sorry. And then like five minutes later, the plane dips, and I just like freak out, right? <laughs> and he laughs for like 10 minutes. <laughs> and then proceeds over the next two days to tell everyone he meets the story of how I freaked out on the plane. So it was funny on, it was for my expense, but it was a pretty funny moment. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Please. Hi, my name is Brian Chagonski. I'm a first year public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, and I was wondering particularly the challenge of maintaining your own voice as a writer while writing for a public figure and kind of also as you made the transition out of writing for him, uh, how you've worked to try and recapture your old voice. Yeah, there's still a few too many look what I have said, Zar. <laughs> uh, but no, it's, it's hard. I don't know. I have totally lost my own voice at this point. Um, and I have not really dug into writing yet because it's only been a couple of weeks. 
but that's going to be one of the more interesting challenges because, you know, it's been eight years and I have not written for myself during those eight years because I haven't had time. And, um, you know, but I have a lot of opinions and uh, a lot of thoughts over the experiences I've had. So I'll definitely get there. But I think to some extent, the way I write will always be sort of a shadow of how, of how he writes. Not, not nearly as good, but it'll be, you know, there'll be uh, echoes of it probably that I won't be able to get rid of. You, did you, you kept a diary? Uh, in the campaign I did. In the White House, I was not as good about it. Yeah, but the good thing is we have emails that, you know, <laughs> will tell most of the story for good or for bad. Yeah, <laughs> please. Hello, my name's Marshall. I'm a first year public policy student. Mm -hmm. You were talking about the uh, health care speech. And I was wondering, uh, there's a lot of critique on the administration on presenting and communicating the health care bill. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how, how that was addressed and, and different things beyond that speech itself that you did to uh, mm -hmm. uh, reverse that tide? You know, it's funny to hear it now. Um, you know, those of us who were there and we're writing these speeches like every single day. Don't exactly buy into the, you know, there was a massive communications failure because, you know, we thought we did a fairly good job of going out there and, and explaining what the health care bill was. Problem is, and I actually think this is true, um, when you're governing these days, you don't have like a huge ad infrastructure like you do in a campaign, right? So we did not have a bunch of money to run a whole bunch of healthcare ads all over the country that let people know what we're for. And when you're in a campaign, the most effective means of communications are ads, right? Which is why people buy so many. Uh, and so I think that a lot of times when you're trying to get a public policy passed while you're you know, in government, you're kind of hamstrung by the communications apparatus that you have, right? The president can go give a big healthcare speech and that healthcare speech will get covered. Next day, the president will go do a big health care rally, and that'll probably get covered too. But the president could do 10 more rallies in a row after that, just distilling it down to the you know, most essential message about what the plan says. And eventually, a reporter's going to get tired of covering that, and they're going to move on to something else. And so now, it's incumbent upon us to figure out a way around that, right? But it's very, it makes it very difficult. And so to, at the end of the day, I think, you know, I do believe that speech and rhetoric can move people very strongly. Um, I was telling someone that for the healthcare debate, I think one of the most effective things that the president did is right towards the end of that debate, he went to the House Democratic Caucus. And um, he gave a speech to them right off the cuff from his heart. Had no notes, had a couple notes in front of him, but that was about it. And he just spoke for 30 or 40 minutes about why this is why most of them got into politics. This is what the Democratic Party is about. This is what we've been doing for 100 years. And you have a chance now. And you can seize that chance now, or we can look back 20 years from now and wonder why we didn't do it. And this is what you did this for. This is what public service for. You've all seen the letters from your, I mean, he just went on and on and on. And you saw people in that room, congressmen that had been like wavering, at least on the Democratic side. And that bucked them up by the end. So, you know, there's different, different ways to do it. And um, it's, always, it's always a trick, but Getting the message out and getting it uh, repeated and making sure it sticks is by far the biggest challenge that any president faces. Please. Hi, I'm Jenny Liu. I'm a second year public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, mm -hmm. have a lot of respect for the art and discipline involved in speech writing, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if you could illuminate a little bit about the process um, that goes on behind preparing a speech to comfort um, a nation in distress. Um, we've seen a lot of episodes of gun violence that have affected communities. So how do you or the president prepare words to um, kind of offer comfort and solace, but also kind of take responsibility as society and offer a way out? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that's a good question. Those are actually the very toughest speeches that we do. Um, part of the reason is, you know, from the time that a, a tragedy strikes to the time that he, he speaks is, is very short. And so you don't have a lot of time to prepare. Uh, I often, you know, first, the process with the president goes like this. 
we meet with him right after it happens, uh, get his thoughts about it. And he usually has, you know, he, he definitely has some thoughts about it. You know, as a father and as someone with two daughters, that's usually at the forefront of his mind when he's talking to us about it. As we go off and, as speechwriters and try to write up a draft, what always helps me is, you know, there's always a lot of really good reporting around tragedies, you know, not so much on cable and whatnot, but on like local newspapers and a lot of these great journalists go into these communities and interview folks and they tell these heroic stories about what happened that would make you cry, you know, the, the second you read them. And I spend a lot of time trying to read those as I'm writing this because I really try to put myself in the shoes of, you know, a community where this happened. And, you know, you draw on your own life experiences about horrible things that have, you know, happened to people that you love. So it becomes a very intense experience. Um, but if you've noticed, you know, when the president has spoken in Tucson, when he's spoken in Aurora, or when he's spoken in Newtown, it always kind of comes back for him to, you know, it, it ends up being like he's speaking at, he's giving a eulogy at almost anyone's funeral that you would, if it was a loved one, if it was a friend. That, you know, a president should be that kind of comforter. It should be that personal, right? And so you're, you don't really sit there and think, I'm speaking to the whole nation about a tragedy and comfort the nation. You kind of take it to a very personal level. And, you know, if someone that I really cared about passed away in a tragedy, what would I say? What would I say about their lives? What would I say about the rest of us that are still left grieving? And that's kind of how you go into those speeches. And that's, that's at least how he, um, he approaches them. Yeah. Please. Uh, Nick Bond, so I'm a visiting college student. I've been admitted. Uh, it's great to see you here today. Um, my question was around um, the president's quite extensive use of the teleprompter. Mm -hmm. um, it's been widely reported. Is it a big deal, and how does it affect his, uh, his speech making? Yeah, it is not a big deal. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's one of the more ridiculous things uh, that, that we deal with because, look, there are very few presidents that uh, I don't know of many presidents at all that don't use any prepared remarks, right? Everyone once in a while does. They speak off the cuff. But presidents as far back as Lincoln, Washington, they were using prepared remarks. So now we're talking about the difference between reading off a piece of paper that's down here or reading off a screen that's up here. <laughs> and so I never really understood. And the president is just better at reading off the screen just because the way his eyes are than looking down at a piece of paper. Um, I also think that this president, unlike a lot of presidents, uh, writes a lot of his own material. And that's well known. He's an author, he's written two books. So the idea that somehow, you know, he's just this robot that like needs the teleprompter is, you know, it's good fodder for a lot of people, but it just doesn't have any basis in reality. But, you know, it persists because it's one of those silly things that we deal with in politics. Hi, uh, my name is John. I'm a junior at the college from Turkey. Um, I read this article uh, on the New York Times in October, uh, and I considered it to be a very harsh criticism. Um, it was about Obama needing to be the narrator, the, the narrator in chief, mm -hmm. and how um, you know the president was lacking an overarching uh, narrative, um, a sustained argument, and. I found that to be a harsh criticism, and you know, now that the election is over, now that you're not on the team, how would you respond to that article? Uh, when when was argument? it? That there is no sort of overarching narrative. That there's was it, no, did you say it was in October? Or? October, yes. Yeah. Well, then he won the election. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite thing about articles before the election, that are harsh and critical. Um, <laughs> no, but that, I mean, it's a great example, because what happens is, you know, when poll numbers are going down or poll numbers are going up, there are a million reasons and analysis that come out that will, will describe why. And, you know, one of the favored ones that has come up is this, like, the president doesn't have a narrative and people don't know what he believes. Well, it turns out when you, you know, looked at most of the, uh, the polling, the public polling, or a lot of the research that we saw throughout the campaign, people really did know what he stood for. They knew what he believed in. They knew what his policies were. They knew what his values were. To the extent that there was any um, hesitancy, it was <coughs> what we always knew, which is the economy was not back to full strength. And is there, is this, can this other guy maybe do a better job of getting it there faster? Right? They decided no. 
But I think it sounds very simplistic to like boil, and it's not very exciting to boil an election down to that. But I think that has a lot more truth to it than a lot of the other, you know, was it the first debate? Was it, does he not have a narrative? Does it, just, you know, that, that just kind of. Let me follow this up because it does raise a fundamental question. <clears throat> you know, Mary Cuomo famously said candidates campaign in poetry and, and govern in prose. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about uh, President Obama. He, his campaign speeches have moved the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just been, I think it's just demonstrable. Whether it's Philadelphia, or, you, know, you could go through a number of speeches, and in the, in the second campaign, he he appears to have had a harder time moving the country as president. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether it's the nature of the job, the nature of the speech you're trying to give. Is there somebody about the context that changes? I think it's less about, you know, I don't necessarily think he's had a harder time moving the country. Uh, I think that how the country felt about him during the campaign. Versus, well, first of all, during the campaign, he also, you know, you don't make a lot of decisions, governing decisions that, you know, end up alienating half the country because right. you have to pick a side at some point, right? So there's that. But I think his personal popularity actually has, the fact that his personal popularity has upheld so strongly shows that a lot of what people, you know, liked about him back in 2008, they still like about him today. Mm -hmm. I think what he's had, what's been harder to move is Congress. And, um, and the reason that is, is, you know, we just have a system, you know, we've all talked about whether it's the gerrymandering, whether it's the filibuster, whether it's all these kind of machinations that are going on in Congress. I think it is very difficult to expect that a president's oratory is going to convince, you know, a very conservative Republican who has decided they will not support even a dime of new revenue, no matter what, mm -hmm. no matter what happens, um, you know, to suddenly go along with your plan. And so no amount of rhetoric, no amount of negotiation, I mean, it, it's tough to, you know. Yeah, but it's hard, I mean, you know, like gun control, we've just been reading the last mm -hmm. few days, support for gun control, you know, the survey, survey just come out, it's down five or 10 points from where it was. Right. His own approval rating has come down five, six, seven points since uh, December. It, it, it just, it's, it's very hard to govern this country. Yes, that, it, it is. It's very hard to govern. And I think that's just because, you know, we have a very polarized system in the Congress right now, and it's very hard to change that. And, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know what breaks that fever, mm -hmm. right? Because he, you know, everyone's like, oh, he's got to go on the charm offensive, right? And so here's the charm offensive, and what's happening? But, you know, I mean, the last trip I was on with him, uh, we went to Newport News, Virginia, and we saw a Navy shipyard that was going to be hurt by the sequester. And we took a congressman with us, Scott Rigel, who's a, a Republican from Virginia. And he's from that district. He sees, like, what that could do, what the sequester could do to his district, what it could do to those, what, what it could do to those jobs. And he said to the president, I would be happy to look at closing a bunch of loopholes and doing tax reform and, you know, getting some revenue if it meant saving this community, you know? I, so the, I think part of this whole, like, charm offensive thing is the president actually believes that there's plenty of really good-natured, you know, still strong Republicans out there who are willing to say, here's what I believe, and I'm not going to change it, but I'm willing to compromise. I'm willing to sit down. And, you know, if there are more people like that, we'll get something done. Hmm. But I think it's, you know, if we hope that, you know, the days of him going up and like giving a speech and all of a sudden all these Repu congressional Republicans are going to be like, oh, that was a brilliant speech. Forget it. I'm with you. Let's raise some taxes. Uh, but before he went on the charm offensive, he did go on a camp, what looked like a campaign to, for, in favor of his programs against sequestration and he dropped it and went on the charm offensive. Right. And it was as if maybe they decided, they, they, even by going on the campaign trail, it's really hard to move opinion enough to change the Congress. I think you do. I think you'll see him do both. You know, I think he'll he'll continue to go out there. I mean, you know, that event that we did with that congressman, he said exactly what he was for. Said exactly what he believed in. You know, some like I'm sure Boehner called it a campaign-like speech, but the Republican congressman we had with us, he was very pleased to hear it. He was happy. You know, so I think that. But you know, now he's in a stage where he figures, you know, reaching out to some people like that would be a good thing. 
Terrific. I, I, we just got a signal that we have time for two more questions. So Great. here and here. We'll be. Uh, John, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is uh, James Gutierrez. I'm a MPP student here graduating um, in two months. I was uh, a uh, intern in the Office of the First Lady, uh, policy intern two years ago. Okay. Um, so um, this president's journey has been very improbable from, from many respects. And I think the, the fascinating part for me in having you here today is that parallels your journey um, in, in many ways. Um, and I think it's also fascinating that you sit here um, before a room of, of people that are about your same age. And uh, so you're not even in your first half of your life um, and you have a lot, lot uh, ahead. And I'm wondering, what does this mean personally for you and for the next chapters in your life? Um, I mean, this has been, you know, I, I don't know what I'll do from here, but I, I'm pretty sure that this will have been one of the most meaningful experiences of my life, for sure. You know, I, I wanted to go, I took a chance on public service. Um, I took a chance on, on politics when I was out of school. It had not been something that I wanted to do my entire life. I didn't know that I was going to like it. Joined a campaign, lost. Um, was broke <laughs> and was very kind of disillusioned by politics after that campaign, um, partly because we worked so hard just to kind of see it slip away at the end and I cared a lot about where the country was headed. So I didn't know if I would ever, at a very young age where I was supposed to be idealistic, I didn't know if I would ever do this again. Um, and then I, when I sat down with Barack Obama, um, it, what it was most was his authenticity, and I think that uh, part of what we miss today in politics is that sense of authenticity and, and people who are willing to tell the truth and be themselves and look, you know, everyone's going to do their political thing, everyone's going to play politics once in a while, everyone's going to hire their pollsters and their, you know, uh, their speechwriters and all that kind of stuff, but I think that a lot of people you know, turn on the news today, a lot of young people, and they hear people tell them, you know, that every motivation of every politician on either side of the aisle is purely cynical, and that they are doing everything they do for their own self-interest, to either make money or to gain power and stuff like that, and it's everywhere. It's both parties, right? And I know that's a lie, and I know it's a lie because of um, the people I worked with over the last eight years, and I know it's a lie because of the president I worked for. Because I know that there are actually really good people in this government. And I've met really good people on the other side of the aisle who are here because they actually want to get something done and because they actually have core beliefs. And, and they're not doing this because it's just a game. And so walking away with that sense from this after eight years of a lot of tough battles and a lot of bad days, um, that leaves me pretty inspired. So. Last question, yes, please. My name is Matthias Rosbach. I'm a visiting researcher at the law school. Um, I have a question concerning your experiences when you transitioned from a campaign speechwriter to a presidential speechwriter. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what constraints did you experience then? Which, which institutional constraints? Did people try to influence your speeches when writing for the President of the United States? Uh, who had to approve of your speeches? And, and how did the departments interact with you when writing on certain policies? Yeah. No, it's, I mean, as the president has had to make that transition for the decisions he makes, like all the rest of us do too that are working for him, and for speech writing, um, and this gets to the kind of the poetry prose thing, there's some nice lines that you might want in the speech, but then someone in a, in a, in a policy area that's, you know, it's, it's going to mean the stock market either crashes or not, is going to tell you, well, you've got to change that line because it's really important. Uh, I remember when I first got there, it was in the middle of the, uh, financial collapse in the middle of the credit crisis. And, you know, I hadn't even taken an economics class <laughs> in college, and so I learned my economics from Tim Geithner and Larry Summers and Christina Romer <laughs> in the middle of the crisis, you know, which was good because I was like, well, we, we'll teach the American people at the same time. Um, and so, uh, you know, when I would write a speech about what the credit crunch met, meant and what it meant to do credit default swaps and all those other things that now we know about. Um, you know, if I didn't want those in there because they sounded too boring and wonky, well, Tim Geithner would say, hey, you got to keep that in there or else, like, the markets could crash. And I'm like, okay, 
you're Tim Geiger, so I'll do that. Um, so you do, you face a lot of constraints, but the way you deal with it is you build relationships with the people that know what they're talking about, and, and you build trust with them. So at some point you can say, is this really critical to the fate of the economy or national security, or can I maybe dial it back a little bit so people aren't sleeping during the speech and we can you know, take some of this out of here? And I've actually had not a big problem with it at all because we've worked with such great people. And I've had very few instances where I've wanted to you know, completely pull my hair out over it. Let me ask you one other last question. It, it, it is notable that it, uh, your successor is a Kennedy School graduate, which we're, we're, is we'll look forward Cody to Cody Keenan. Greet him. To, yes, uh, let me ask one last question about the president himself. You know, many of you in the press describe him as remote. Some of his friends and some of his critics say he's remote. They don't really understand him, don't know him. You worked with him really, really closely. Who is the man that you got to know? Yeah, it's so, he's the least remote person that I could imagine. I mean, he's just, he's warm, he's friendly, he's patient. Um, he has never, in all of the stress he's been under, in all of the situations he's been in, yelled at me, raised his voice, walked out of a room, like, really angry. He's very honest with you. And he also, like, wants to know about your life, you know? He's, mm -hmm. how's everything going? Like, how's your love life? How, you having fun? You doing that? I mean, he's, yeah, he's just, he's a really good person. And I think that his, um, I don't know where the, re I think that the remoteness thing comes from. He doesn't do artifice well. He doesn't do shtick well, right? Because it goes back to that authenticity thing, I was saying, is that he knows who he is, he believes who he is, and he's not gonna like put on some facade just because like he's supposed to glad handle someone, right? He would rather actually get to know that person, talk to them, have a real conversation, not recite talking points, and enjoy the person's company. Um, so that's the kind of person he is. He's really funny, um, and uh, you know, and he's just, he's, he's also this whole like no drama thing. It's, it's really true. I mean, he is the last one in the whole staff to freak out about something, you know, while we're all like running around scared about this or that, or some bad article came out or a bad poll number, he's kind of the one that's just like, guys, we got this, it's fine. Take the long view. Ladies and gentlemen, John Favreau. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.